On a beautiful winter morning in December, buses dropped off their precious cargo. Nearly 500 elementary children who filed into their school with the expectations that all little children have that good things would be happening during their day. And little in the way of worries. Well, maybe what's for lunch today? Will I have a chance to play with my friends at recess? In the first three classrooms in the front hallway, the little first graders' coats were hung up and the morning routines began with circle time on the rug with their teacher. There they discussed the calendar and the activities a day of the day along with the activity from the responsive classroom. This is the typical routine of Sandy Hook Elementary School, a place that exudes nurturing and caring from the moment you walk through the door. If you pass a child or adult in the halls, you'll get a smile and a cheerful greeting. Children's work is posted in the halls, so you know right away you're in a kid's place. Sandy Hook Elementary School seemed like the safest place on earth in this quiet little suburban community. This school has been known for the superb education that students receive and has been acknowledged as a vanguard school. Not only has it been a high achieving school, but its tradition of caring about the whole child is quite well known. This school is an important piece of the fabric of this tight knit community. That morning was like every other morning, after all routines are comforting to children, until about 9.30, when a troubled young man carrying three guns, one of them an AR-15 assault rifle, shot out the glass window to bypass the buzz-in system at the door and changed the lives of so many people in the next few minutes. As he entered, he was confronted by the principal, Don Hawksprung, the lead teacher, Natalie Hammond, and the school psychologist, Mary Sherlock, who emerged from a meeting in a conference room. I can just picture Dawn's indignation that someone would dare enter her school and put her babies at risk. It would be so like her to be the protective mother hen and never think of her own safety, but only of protecting her children and making him stop right then and there. I can visualize her trying to take charge of this unthinkable threat. Dawn, ever the passionate ed educator, would do anything to protect her charges. That's where they found the bodies of Dawn and Mary rushing toward the attacker. Natalie fortunately survived the attack with serious injuries. He then went to the office directly across from the front door where, he, where normally three secretaries would be working. Only one was there and she flew under her desk, dragging the phone with her. Fortunately, he didn't see her. The shooter bypassed the first first grade classroom and began shooting in another first grade, killing the school's permanent substitute teacher, Lauren Rousseau, and all but one child who was clever enough to play dead. By this time, the teacher in the third room had crammed as many children as possible into the bathroom and was trying to hide, find hiding for the others when the shooter took aim at her and her students. Vicki Soto, who was so excited to finally reach her dream to be a teacher, threw herself in front of her students. Such incredible bravery for a young first grade teacher. Anne Marie Murphy was the educational assistant for a young boy with some special needs, and she died trying to shield him, as was the case with Rachel Devino, a behavior therapist. None of these brave women were trained in combat. They were elementary school educators de dedicated to educating their young children. So their first response when confronted by this terror was to protect the children. Thank goodness for our first responders. They arrived in three minutes, which is incredible in a town of over 60 square miles, mainly country roads. They saved innumerable lives as this shooter carried enough ammunition to have continued throughout the school. And this loving little elementary school was helpless in the face of this assault. As I'm standing outside my office a few miles away speaking with the principal, my secretary comes running out of her office to say, there's a shooting at Sandy Hook. Now my first response was, that's not possible. It must be near there maybe a domestic dispute, call the school to see if we need lockdown. 
When she could get no answer, she came back quite alarmed. I decided to call the police department, which rang a long time. Then a harried desk sergeant answered. I identified myself and said I'd heard there was a shooting in Sandy Hook School, and could he verify that? He said, yes, but I can't talk to you, ma'am, and the line went dead. What do I do now? I needed to know more. I called our emergency operations center and spoke to the director who said, superintendent, you better sit down. She told me there'd been a shooting and they were not sure if there was a second shooter. Stay where you are and we will keep you informed. I put all schools in lockdown and had all private schools in nearby districts also informed. I paced for just a few minutes, then drove to the school. It was an unbelievable scene. Emergency vehicles, sirens, chaos. I couldn't get through, so I drove my car off the road onto an embankment and ran. The long driveway to the schools was blocked off and SWAT teams were running down the driveway. The Sandy Hook Fire Station is on the corner and that was our staging area. As I entered the season, the scene became even more confusing. I saw SWAT teams, ambulances, emergency vehicles, and police from a number of towns. The teachers had arrived there with their students. Some of the students were clustered around their teacher, and the teacher was telling stories or watching TV. One teacher, the math specialist, rushed up to me when she saw me and wanted to know if I knew anything about Dawn. I didn't, and she was first to tell me they had heard over the intercom that Dawn had been shot. We could not account for Miss Soto's or Mrs. D'Amato's class, but I knew we had children outside the school. I had received a call that some children were at the police station, some were at a neighboring house, some had shown up at a daycare center, and the art teacher had called to say she was in the kiln room with some students. So we did not have a true picture of where our students were and the magnitude of this whole episode. As commanding officers arrived at the scene, they asked me to join them in a small room being used as a command center. They had a lot of questions, but no information. The media was reporting that this was a domestic shooting with the son shooting his mother. I informed the officers that there was no Lanza working for our school system. I called HR to see if there was a substitute by that name, but no. I was in and out of that, of, of that room as each agency's chief arrived, but I had still not learned the extent of this tragedy. Parents had come running to the fire station looking for their children and we felt it was best to release them to the parents and police could continue questioning them later. Each teacher had a sign out sheet and as the parents left hugging their children, it became increasingly apparent that we had more parents than children. We asked those families to come to the back room and wait until we knew more. Clergy had begun arriving and were staying in there with those families. I called for a couple of our psychologists who were crisis trained to join those families in the room. After some time, the Newtown police chief asked me outside the firehouse. As we leaned against a red emergency vehicle with five or six helicopters overhead, a surreal scene, he told me, Janet, this is really bad. How bad, I asked. He replied, fatalities. Oh my God, Mike, how many? Could be 30. I had to pull it together for my staff and my families and the work that needed to be done. The task of identifying the victims was the next problem as the teachers who knew them were deceased and parents could not possibly be taken to that scene. We discussed using three special area teachers who might know the children, but as they started to walk up the hill, that fell apart. I asked the math, te math teacher if school pictures had arrived. Yes, but nobody knew where they were. We called the school secretary who was out sick to come in to locate the pictures in the office. Police took her into the school, shield, shielding her from the scene. Those school pictures were used for identification of our children. The room in the back with the anxious families was the worst place I'd ever been. I was in and out, walking around, not sure what I could be doing. Finally, our governor, who couldn't stand the sorrow of those families not knowing, told them that if they were in there, their loved one was dead. It was quiet in the firehouse late that evening as work continued at the school and the families left. And I realized that food had been set up, magically appeared, and I hadn't eaten all day. I tried, but gave up. I still wasn't sure what I needed to be doing. 
The families were officially notified late that night, some not until one o'clock in the morning, by a state trooper who was to become their liaison going forward and counselors. The next morning, I was surprised to see all of my office staff and some of our principals pre present at central office. I didn't tell them to come in, they just felt a need. All of us were looking to do something. That something became immediately apparent as the phones began ringing and rang for weeks on end. Our website crashed. There were no open phones, so we had to set up another line that was private. I received over 13,000 emails within the next three days. We were immediately inundated with condolences, questions, offers, gifts, volunteers, and of course the media. The challenges of dealing with the aftermath go far beyond the emotional. One call tells us that two trucks loaded with toys are on their way from 900 miles away. The next call is informing us that 450 teddy bears have been sent, and this was just the beginning. We didn't have the infrastructure to answer this volume of calls. We didn't have a warehouse to store this quantity of donations. Monday's ma mail was described as an avalanche. We didn't have the people needed to just respond to the outside world. There was a lot of caring, and people just wanted to help in some way. We didn't know how to handle the situation. I went to the first selectman and asked for logistical help. She mobilized volunteers, and someone obtained a warehouse. 20 volunteers a day opened letters and packages. Meanwhile, I needed to figure out how my staff and students were coping and determine how we could resume teaching and learning. Interspersed with this were the media requests. It was a shock to me to go to a press conference on Saturday and see the thousands of press people from all over the world camped out at Treadwell Park. When our vehicle was blocked by a Japanese film crew unloading from the vehicle, I was suddenly aware for the first time that this was really a world event. I'd been too preoccupied to think beyond what I was dealing with. With much objection, we started school for the six schools other than Sandy Hook on Tuesday. I felt it was in the best interest of students to get back to their familiar routines and to feel safe, and that was confirmed once they re resumed. Sandy Hook was another challenge and what was best for those students and teachers. They certainly could not go back to their school. The community of Richfield offered me five classrooms. The community of Derby offered rooms, but I was concerned about splitting this school up. Monroe, our neighboring community, was a lifesaver, offering us a closed middle school. While the Sandy Hook staff and families attended services for 26, work began in earnest on Chalk Hill School in Monroe, transforming it into a cheery elementary school. At one point, there were 80 volunteers a day working on that building. The gym floor was warped, but it was repaired to a gleaming finish. Bathroom toilets were too tall and too high for little children, but the floor was raised as a creative solution. Night and day, there were skilled people turning this abandoned building into a new Sandy Hook, mainly volunteers with donated materials. Watching this transformation was like watching a miracle being performed. And of course, food magically appeared each day. After the first of the year, we cautiously opened the school after inviting parents to bring their children to visit and urging them to send them on the bus. If they were nervous, they could come to the school and meet their children getting off the bus. About 120 parents did that and hung around that day. There were at least 11 mental health specialists available to talk to parents and to answer their questions on handling their children's questions. The next day, there were still about 20, and the number began to dwindle. 20 beautiful and innocent little first graders were lost that day in a senseless act. They were no match for a troubled person with an AR-15. Six dedicated educators were lost that day, including a phenomenal principal, Don Hawksprung, who took over the leadership of Sandy Hook School only two and a half years before. She was an experienced principal whose passion for this work was immediately evident. She had a vast knowledge of good instruction and coached her already effective teachers to stretch even further for excellence. She truly enjoyed being an elementary principal and joined in all the fun of an elementary school with, gust, with great gusto. Whatever theme day the school was celebrating, she was all in. She might show up at district administrators meeting in pajamas and fuzzy slippers or dressed as a fairy princess. The students knew that she liked to have fun as part of learning. Yet she was serious about ensuring that every child 
had a highly effective teacher. She, along with her colleagues lost that day, represent a huge loss to the futures of all those children they would have impacted in their professional lives. All of us are forever changed. Some families have a huge hole left by a six-year-old who should be doing the funny, silly things that six-year-olds do. Families who have their children are suffering through the nightmares and fears of sound and strangers. The innocence of childhood has truly been shattered. What do we say to parents who want to be assured that when they put their children on the bus to school that they will come home safely? How do we as a society protect our students without creating fortresses? How do we let our children freely enjoy being children? I have heard that the measure of a society is how they treat their children. So how do we do all that we need to do to keep our children safe so they can enjoy their, fut their futures? In closing, I want to share with you something that stayed with me throughout this time. I may not do justice to his words, but I will share the thoughts of Dr. John Woodall, a Harvard-trained psychiatrist with expertise in the effects of trauma. After a loss or a traumatic event, there's that terrible period of grieving. It's unavoidable as much as we may want those awful feelings to go away. We can deal with those feelings successfully or unsuccessfully. Unsuccessfully may include other negative consequences like depression, substance abuse, or relationship issues. Or we can get through our grieving more successfully. The difference is the choice we make. We can't take the grief away, but we can control our response. He refers to this as our compassionate choice. That is to focus outside of ourselves and what we can do for others instead of internally. Thank you.